Hey guys and girls, it's uh, Nathan here, just uh, obviously with tonight's webinar. So lots of interesting stuff uh, <clears throat> in, each, in which I'd be talking about and covering off. So uh, just wanted to make sure before we get started, if everyone just can, you know, maybe just write a, in the question box uh, if they can hear me and yeah, and we'll get the show on the road. Beautiful. Awesome. Thanks, guys. So I just wanted to obviously a little bit about the uh, the webinar series and a few housekeeping rules. Um, tonight, I'll be talking about some very controversial things and taking a bit of a, a delve down into uh, the property market of where it's sitting in 2018. And obviously, looking at uh, in the news and the media out there, there's lots of miscommunication as to you know, is the property market going to go up? Is it going to go down? So on and so forth. So today uh, I'll be covering off on a lot of things, some controversial things. Uh, just remembering that all of this is just my own personal opinion and uh, none of it should be conceived as financial advice. I'm not your financial advisor. Always remember to have your own uh, advice that's independent to your own situation. And um, yeah, we'll get on the road. So just a bit of a recap uh, of what I've been talking about in previous uh, sort of webinars that I've been doing. Uh, I can see some questions coming through. Keep the questions coming through throughout uh, the webinar, and I'll try and answer them. If I can't answer them tonight, uh, just due to time constraints, I'll uh, attempt to do some videos of them, which I'll be filming uh, tomorrow anyway. So uh, I can see if you're coming through now. But I just want to talk a little bit about the financial system. Uh, people often ask me, Nathan, you know, how have you been able to build such an amass and amass a, a large property portfolio over the course of the last you know 15 years uh, it all comes down to understanding how financial markets work how the monetary system works and how monetary policy actually works so uh, on a little bit of the previous webinars which you may not have seen uh, we'll be talking about what's happening in the marketplace uh, what is the gfd the gfd is my thoughts on what we're about to go into, which is a global financial depression. The GFC was the uh, global financial crisis. Um, I talked a little bit about how it happened, and I've got a few slides which I'll pop up randomly uh, in tonight's presentation, which I'll cover off on as to, you know, what I'm seeing, some of the sort of indications uh, which are, you know, out there that are, you know, causing concern for me, and also looking at the benefits of what that means for a property investor. <clears throat> uh, also looking at, you know, in the previous ones, and I encourage you if you haven't seen them, uh, to email through to the office, um, and you know, they'll be able to point you in the right direction to have a look and tune into those ones. But be looking at the monetary system, how to protect yourself, how to prepare yourself for knowledge, uh, what will happen during the crash, what will happen after the crash, um, how to protect yourself, what does it mean for property, and so on and so forth. So just before I get the show on the road tonight, uh, I've got a little graph here, uh, which we can see on the screen. And if we have a look uh, on the left-hand side, this is uh, production over the course of the last 10 years. Um, basically in Western worlds, what we've seen uh, was a very close correlation with actual consumption and production. And as, uh, as we've seen the last 10 years, we've seen a lot of changes happen out there in the monetary system. When the GFC came, there was lots of measures which actually sort of, uh, you know, tried to starve us off from a recession and that came in the form of stimulus. And stimulus is what's caused the recent uh, property boom that we've seen. Uh, pretty much for as much money that's been put into the market, uh, there's been that much sort of growth happening in the market. And we're going through a phase, I believe now, which is a liquidity, um, tightening phase where we've been through quantitative easing, now we're going through quantitative tightening. If we're going to look at all of the advanced countries in the world, the same uh, stories are being told on the front page of the newspaper. So going back 12, 24 months ago, we saw Sydney house prices unaffordable, Melbourne house prices unaffordable. A lot of people, you know, go, well, it's too bad, how did it all happen, etc. But what the stuff is that the media doesn't tell you is, you know, the fundamentals of how the financial system works. Uh, these same stories appeared on the front pages of the US, the UK, Canada, uh, the Philippines, everywhere around the world, 
Um, and it wasn't for any other fundamental reason apart from the fact that the monetary supply had been tampered with. So if we have a look at this chart here, uh, just for giggles, uh, we can see is this orange line here is our consumption. Uh, the blue line is what we're producing. And there is a big disconnect as we're going through. Uh, we can start seeing that it's starting to taper off and that's due to um, quantitative tightening where money is being taken out of the money, out of the system. And that's all the money that's helped us to get to where we are today. So there is lots of indicators out there which are causing the concern for me and I will be covering off on some more of them. Obviously, each one of these webinars and we only have about an hour. Sometimes most of the time I'm going over the hour, so just be aware that it may go a bit longer than an hour. But um, basically uh, looking out there, you know, there's lots of indications which are you know, pointing to me that I'm seeing that are pointing to the fact that we're going through a deflationary cycle and it doesn't necessarily mean bad thing for property, but being property investors or wanting to get into the property market, you guys are probably all excited to think, to see, you know, what is happening out there and, and how can you capitalise upon it. So on uh, today's webinar, I'll be talking about how to make money uh, in property in the next two years. Uh, how over the decades I've witnessed many different market cycles and adapted as they have came, generally before they have arrived, and that is what I'm doing today. Also looking at the fundamentals of the markets, researching what could happen with different types of properties, discussing the opportunities uh, that I see ahead and the risky ends of the market, uh, sharing my research uh, from 2018 so far and the synopsis of that, and reviewing all of my moves in previous market cycles. So for those of you that, you know, probably haven't seen me talk about this sort of stuff beforehand, you know, um, when I quit my job, and it was going back in 2009, I quit my job during the middle of the GFC. And the only reason why I was able to do that is because I had, you know, positioned myself well enough to be able to uh, carry the right assets and the right type of properties and the right type of financial instruments to get me through that market cycle. So it's important that you prepare for it um, because the market is constantly changing. People have just seen house prices explode over the course of the last you know, 10 years and not every market has moved in that format, but the normal bread and butter sort of areas, um, major capital cities, especially on the eastern um, seaboard, have seen um, you know, a large amount of growth happening, uh, but it's all, you know, there's there's been every three months, there's some sort of change out there in the marketplace. Uh, and most notably, this phase that we're heading through, uh, we entered this around September 2016. Um, just seeing a, a few questions pop up. I'll get to them a little bit later on. Um, so how to make money in, uh, in, in property in 2018, 2019? Um, basically, over the decades, uh, you know, as, as it says here, I've noticed many different market cycles. And if we have a look, most property market cycles have been manipulated in one way, shape or form uh, with the notion of, uh, you know, stimulus uh, or, or different sort of things that have happened out there. Uh, what I'm seeing at the moment is uh, a, a currency debasement, which you know, I talk mainly about property in my channels, uh, but it, I think it's important that I talk more so about what underpins the property market, and that's why I've committed myself to doing uh, these webinar series. So if we look at the Sydney market, for example, or most markets in the early 2000s, we saw the prices rise. Uh, you know, interest rates had come down in the early 2000s, and there was a lot of stimulus packages which were created to try and uh, spur on, um, you know, people buying property. Uh, obviously, if property, we're in a country where it's a young country. Uh, we need, um, you know, to keep ourselves prosperous. And going back in the early 2000s, we saw the introduction of the $7,000 first home in a grant, coupled that with um, the uh, interest rates going downwards. Um, moving forward from that, we saw the markets, like for example, Sydney, I'm gonna just use Sydney as an example, because that's where I'm from. Um, we saw the Sydney markets sort of um, taper off around 2000, 2003, 2004, and that's where interest rates started to climb up a little bit. Um, however, we also saw uh, rollbacks of the first home grants and stuff like that. If we look at 2008, 2009, which was in the GFC, most people were fearful, people were scared for their jobs and stuff like that, and I feel that that's sort of the phase of where we're going into. 
Um, however, this time, what will trigger off uh, back in 2008, for those of you that don't know, what triggered off uh, the GFC was um, basically derivatives, although called CDOs, of about seven and a half trillion dollars over in the US. And those uh, derivatives defaulted and there were issues within the loans and it was a, it was a housing crisis which caused the whole global financial uh, you know, system to have issues with it. Um, from that, you know, there was a lot of stimulus that came after that. So if you recall back in, you know, 2008, 2009, we saw Kevin Rudd, he was in, uh, in, in power at the time, and uh, he obviously tried to stimulate the economy uh, by giving, doing stimulus package, helicopter money. Um, there, was a, there was a guy that was the most powerful guy in the world at the time. Most people think it would have been the president. Uh, it wasn't. It was a guy by the name of Ben Bernanke in the US with the US Fed reserve which uh, basically he said if worst case scenario happened would throw uh, bundles of notes out of the helicopter and that's where the term helicopter money comes from uh, but basically helicopter money uh, started happening uh, to most advanced economies and in turn uh, the system as i showed from that those stats beforehand all the charts sort of moved away from their fundamentals from sound money into uh, you know, just funny money, which uh, I think we're going to see the ramifications of that happen as all the fundamentals are off the table. Um, but in essence, back in 2008, there was a lot of people that were scared of the markets, uh, didn't know where to put their money into safe safety sort of markets. We saw the, the stock market uh, drop quite considerably and lots of financial markets around the world uh, turn up on their heads. What we did see from that is that the RBA had actually reduced uh, the interest rates from uh, the Reserve Bank of Australia uh, from 7.25% at the time, all the way down to 3% with a matter of five months. So that was very large. Uh, the interest rates have never moved downwards in that fast of a fashion, but that sort of helped us stay clear of a recession and boosted the economy. And what came after that, sorry, the other thing that happened was um, we lacks of policies for people to buy uh, from overseas to Australia because safe money is considered in Australia or safe assets because you know we're not a war-torn country and people aspire to live here and our property market is quite strong. So uh, from that we saw you know lots of stimulus go into the property market and uh, obviously that is contributed to the success of what's happened to most of the major eastern seaboard countries since then. Uh, basically we're now at a point where uh, the quantitative easing uh, methods that were put into place, we've become you know, addicted to the cheap money uh, that we've been accustomed to. And we're starting to see that money being drawn back out of the system. I'll head to some charts a little bit later on that. But a few things to remember is that not all property markets are equal. That, sorry, I've got the water, I'm overcoming a, a flu. But, not all property markets are equal. We've seen, um, you know, the last few years, Sydney rise, Melbourne rise, Brisbane. I still think that, you know, Brisbane's had a fair bit of construction happening up there, but I still think the Queensland market is probably the most undervalued market in the country. Uh, whilst we look at other areas like regional areas, mining towns, um, you know, Northern Territory, uh, Perth, uh, those sort of cities, we have seen a decline in housing prices. So it's important to understand <clears throat> what are the uh, fundamental uh, drivers underpinning each property market and understand that there's out of market forces which will control uh, ultimately what goes up, what goes down, what goes sideways. Um, what I've always seen over the course of the last you know, 15 years is obviously my exposure is quite unique out there in the marketplace and very different to uh, most people. Uh, most people that would talk like I would talk would normally pull out statistical data. Uh, and on these occasions, statistical data would be wrong. Um, but I've got access to real world uh, sort of information because over the course of the last decade, I've been a part of over 10,000 real estate transactions uh, for myself and other people, you know, just within the business that I'm exposed to. And I start to see, I start seeing trends from real estate agents, from finance side of things, from lawyers, and so on and so forth. And yeah, that sort of gives me a great indication as to what is to come, and you know, sentiment and things that are happening out there in the marketplace. Now, with it, some throughout every sort of year, 
of my investing or sold my first property uh, in Western Sydney, Mount Druid in 2003. And since then, I've been buying properties every year and continue to do so uh, throughout every single marketplace. And you know, there's been different opportunities that have presented themselves over the years, different sort of things that I've required for my own personal property portfolio. So sometimes I'll be looking for cash flow, sometimes I'll be looking for equity, sometimes I'll be looking for capital growth, sometimes I'll be looking for future potential. And you know, structuring the portfolio uh, throughout those sort of markets has enabled me to go, okay, I need to get some cash flow, I need to get some equity, and be able to you know, adjust what you need for your portfolio at a certain period of time. But the opportunities um, have presented themselves out there in every sort of marketplace. I've just got a few notes here that I'll put down on my screen as well. Um, I think it's important as well um, to sort of identify what you require as an investor. Uh, do you need cash flow? Do you need capital? Um, you know, a lot of people come and say, I want to get a property that's going to be positive cash flow. Right? I've always talked about the three things that are important to me in property investing, below market value, upside for capital growth, and a strong cash flow. Uh, having a uh, good upside for growth, being below market value, sorry, has always put a buffer in because you know, when, as I said, I quit my job during the GFC, uh, you know, at that period of time, I was thinking, you know, what would happen if, I paid too much for a property, so on and so forth. So I uh, worked out very early that if I'm buying it 20% cheaper, then I've built in a sort of buffer in there. If I bought it 10% cheaper, I've built in a buffer. Most people just go out there and get emotionally attached. As we know, in any sort of business situation, uh, if you add emotion to the equation, uh, you generally it doesn't end up too pretty. So it's important to treat your investing uh, like a business and the numbers inevitably won't lie. So, um, yeah, buying at below market value puts that buffer in place as well as giving me access to you know, pull some equity, put it into the next one. Uh, making sure there's got room for upside for growth, that's obviously why I buy those properties for us, because I want to see growth on them. And making sure there's got a strong cash flow means that, you know, my philosophy back in the day was if I lost my job and all things turned to shit, then uh, basically I would still have, so I'll just get rid of the, the phone as well, Forgot to leave that on silent. Um, basically, I would uh, be in a position where if I had to go and work at Macca's on a minimum wage, then my properties would look after themselves without too much of my, you know, wage or whatever going into it. So that's the importance of those three things. And I think, you know, a lot of people over the years have been like, you know, this sounds a little bit boring. I've been to a course. They told me to do a subdivision. They told me to go do this. They go tell me to do that. But what you may not be factoring in is how the actual market underneath it, uh, you know, behaves, which could cause you grief. And if you stick to the fundamentals, um, you know, you'll have a very sustainable journey. And that's what's enabled me to get to where I am. And obviously, my clients will be able to get to where they are as well. So, um, yeah, having the strategies for that, understanding uh, demographics and uh, the property fundamentals. Um, I've got, I can see a chart that's about to pop up for the next slide, which I'll, I'll keep the property fundamentals of, of um, you know, the demographics and demands. But you know, throughout, if you go throughout all the archives of all my videos that are put on YouTube and whatnot, you will see common trends in there, but you'll also see times where I've had to shift my property journey up. So if I was still trying to build my portfolio like I did back in 2003, I was buying properties out in Western Sydney, Mount Druid, all those sort of areas, and I wouldn't be able to buy those properties that would fit into the equation today. So I've had to go and find other markets within Australia which sort of have the same fundamentals of what that would have for growth, for cash flow, for low entry price, etc., to navigate through those sort of markets. I've seen opportunities where you know, understanding finance, for example, uh, has enabled me to, you know, know what would be the next sort of market to go up. So if I look at, you know, when I worked in a job, I saw someone ask me here, uh, what job did I quit from on the screen? Uh, I worked in a corporate job, I worked in the media industry, and uh, basically, I remember back in 2008, 2007, those times, that the average wage for my colleagues and stuff like that, people on like 60 grand, 70 grand, so forth, um, 
they were all buying properties in certain markets that they could service for at around the three hundred to three hundred and fifty thousand dollar price range. And soon after the uh, the interest rates dropped, the servicing changed at the back end of the banks. Understanding how the banks works a big key, because after um, the uh, the interest rates dropped, the serviceability went up, and now those sort of properties are the ones that are around the six hundred, seven hundred thousand dollar price points. You know, you can sort of predict that what would that enable them to buy the fundamentals of what people could buy those properties we pushed up. So, I've, you know, navigated through different markets. I've found it tough to buy in the Sydney market. So I've gone on and you know I've done bulk deals where I was doing bank repos going back ten years ago, back when you know people got distressed and there was lots of uh, repossessions out there to using that same sort of strategy of negotiation to do those bulk deals where I was talking about at the early 2017 and late 2016, where I was going into developers that I knew that they were getting stuck and buying the land in bulk for cheap. So I've had to sort of navigate through every sort of marketplace. And 2018 and 2019 are very, very different marketplaces where you'll probably see out there in the media that you know, it's a bad time in the market, the market's going to fall down, et cetera, et cetera. You've got idiots that are coming out from overseas trying to spruik their, their business or whatever by creating fear into the market. Uh, at the end of the day, what I like to say is that it doesn't bother me uh, if someone does business with me or not. I know where my financial position's at and I know where my cash flow's at. I know where my assets are at. Um, so I just say things that are a fact. And you probably hear stuff tonight that will sound negative. And you'd be like, why is Nathan saying it? Because it's fact. And, you know, if you can gain something from that sort of knowledge, then adapt it into your own position. But, you know, there's been certain people that have come out into the markets over the course of the last, you know, 10, 20, 30 years. And so the same thing every couple of years they'll come out. Um, but I'm coming out to talk about the negative side of the market just because it is actually what it is and obviously to show that there is opportunities within that sort of market. So if it's a time for someone to be uh, selling a property, it's probably not the best time to sell, but I do think it will get tighter. There's less buyers out there in the marketplace and it's all um, surrounding the financial system as to why the market is, is getting impacted. As I said before, in, in 2007, 2008, 2009, the GFC was caused uh, due to a housing problem in the US, which had a tremor effect out into uh, different uh, liquidity markets uh, in the fi as financial instruments. Uh, this time, due to the level of uh, stimulus and manipulation, should we call it, or fraud, uh, the printing of the money that's happened out there via financial instruments, uh, institutions all around the world, and that's caused a much bigger problem, which they're trying to curve, curve in, um, which will cause another liquidity issue. So it's, this might not be looking at more as an everything sort of bubble rather than just a housing bubble in the US. Uh, but there, there is lots of opportunities on there. So um, when first time in grants came out, um, we saw markets go up. If we look at what happened in 2008, first time in a grant went to $14,000. Coming out of what I think we're gonna see in this current market, uh, I predict that we'll probably see stimulus packages come out, which will have large first time in a grants and so on and so forth. Understanding those markets that are gonna benefit from it, and where uh, the financial markets are sort of targeting. Are they targeting investors? Are they targeting first home buyers? Are they targeting mums and dads or so on and so forth? So um, the, what other, what other notes are here? Uh, yeah, so over the, the course of the last, you know, five years or so, I've helped people sort of build their own goals as far as, you know, I wanna have a dream home, I don't think it can be possible, so on and so forth. Uh, you know, build a property portfolio, use that property portfolio as options uh, to, you know, go and buy your dream home, go and do whatever. Is it a matter of buying, you know, sort of five or 10 properties, selling off half of them, paying off all the debt, owning them unencumbered? Is it a matter of, you know, selling down some properties to buy your dream home? Is it using the fundamentals of buying properties below market value for your dream home? Um, you know, that's sort of worked for myself and for, hundreds if not thousands of my very close clients that I work with on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and I, I think, you know, as I said beforehand, sort of tailor-made strategies to get through each property market is important. So review your strategy constantly uh, to ensure that, you know, you're on track 
your expectations may be to buy 10 properties in Mount Druid at the same numbers as what I bought in, you know, 2003, uh, you know, 180, 170, 220 or whatever. But if you're waiting for that to happen, it's never going to happen. So um, unless an asteroid hits the earth and something happens badly in the market, so I really unsee that, don't see that happening. Um, the other thing is that understanding the financial markets, I actually predicted APRA coming in and doing what they're doing today two years before it happened. Uh, the freaky thing is, is that, you know, I've told specific real estate agents that I deal with what to expect in the market, and that's obviously, you know, helped out with my relationships over the years with them. Um, and they come to me and, you know, ask me for advice as to what they should do in their own business because I see so much of, you know, what happens in the market with litmus paper. Um, and obviously being able to sort of understand how APRA would have affected people, we've been able to navigate sort of the business into a direction where the properties that we're picking up for our clients, it's meant that, you know, while most people got stuck with APRA laws and so on and so forth, being able to develop strategies before it happened and as it happened for them to be able to continue on with the journey instead of being sitting there on the shelf, um, you know, not being able to do anything on the bench on the side. So it's important to understand the markets. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit more about a uh, about negative stuff, uh, but on this chart here that I've got on the screen, just go over to this side. Looking at the fundamentals of the market, um, people say that we've got too many houses or they're too expensive or whatever. Our whole financial system, I believe, is a Ponzi scheme. But you know, if you look at the under lying facts of how finance gets created, the money gets created and so on and so forth. It needs to keep being expanded and expanded and expanded. And as a country, we're a very young country. We've got some very good things that are gonna protect us uh, going forward. Really the biggest, biggest protection that we've got is that we're a young country. We're just over 200 years old, 220 years old or something this year. And, um, 230 years old, it might be, yeah. Um, the, we need to keep bringing people into the country uh, for our economy to be to, to survive. So the more migration that we have, the more demand for property we've got. So on this chart here, uh, we look here at 86 to 98, there was a, um, there was a surplus of properties basically for what we had as our population. And as we've entered into the 2000s, we've opened up the gates, a lot more people coming into the country, a lot more people breeding with the baby bonuses and stuff like that. And we can see here that the, uh, this is from the ANZ Research ABS stats, uh, we've seen the demand for property got. So I remember back when I first started the business, it was about 180,000 dwelling short. Um, and I've seen another chart which from ABS that shows that we're currently about 330. This is showing that we're about 240 thousand houses short, dwelling short. And there's an actual prediction uh, on another chart that we've got and seen where they go up to 600,000 dwelling short by the year 2025 or 2028 or something like that. So as we can see, this, the, the charts are on the right side to actually continue to see growth in property as we have a demand. Now, obviously, as we have, um, you know, we're seeing things getting tighter, developers are starting to not build. Um, you know, the cranes in the sky are going to start disappearing because getting access to liquidity is, is much harder. Um, that will be the pent up of demand to actually push the market a bit higher. And obviously, um, you know, cheap credit is here. I think it will continue to stay. I think that we're addicted to cheap credit, but also see, um, you know, less dwellings being built meaning that um, there'll be a higher rental demand. So if we look back in 2008, 2007 in the Sydney market, uh, rents had a good uh, growth cycle as well. I'm just gonna try and flick over to, no, I need to get back to that one. Um, so what am I seeing out there in the markets at the moment, the fundamentals? Um, liquidity is very, very tough uh, in the current pro property market or in any financial market. I'm speaking to businesses and they're saying that they're, um, accounts receivables are going up and getting access to funds from clients and stuff like that is getting tougher uh, in all different sort of uh, forms of business. 
Um, policies on lending are getting tougher. They may get easier later on, and I think they will. That's a solution out of this market. <coughs> um, policies on overseas investors are getting tougher. Uh, we've seen APRA crack down on expats that are living overseas, being able to get access to property finance in Australia. <coughs> I do see that Australia's property market would probably be the strongest in the world, even though we've seen a lot of growth. But just given the fact that we need to, uh, the population is ever growing and the demand is ever growing, uh, we do have a relatively stable property market. Um, I'm seeing some questions here. Do I think there will be an interest rate rise this year? I actually made a call for an interest rate rise um, at our 2017 VIP uh, Being Best Christmas Party. Uh, on that note, uh, I called that there'd be two 25 basis points in the second half of 2018. Uh, I actually did a video on this, uh, not last month, but the month before when they did the RBA uh, rate uh, announcement. And I made the call that I believe that we'll probably see one before August, uh, looking at the yield curves. I've been looking at yield curves for over the course of the last, um, you know, 10 years. I remember back in the day, I fixed interest rates at a higher amount and I didn't realise that you know, interest rates could move and so forth. So I was scared of them going back to, you know, back in the 80s. But uh, unfortunately, I don't have the chart here today, but interest rates have been on a decline since 19, uh, the 1980s, the end of 1980s. And if we look at globally, uh, we're probably 10 years behind where the US is, but the dollar has been in a death spiral uh, probably since the, the early 1980s. Um, the, and just remember when interest rates do uh, go up, it will affect rental yields as it normally pushes rents up as well uh, behind that. So looking at um, the population, just have a look here, we've still got lots of cheap cities as well in, uh, in Australia. Uh, a lot of people say Sydney is, uh, you know, sort of too expensive and so on and so forth. Uh, I made the call about 2015, I got asked in an interview in the media, and uh, the first thing that came to my head was uh, Sydney is like the New York of Australia. Um, you know, it is a financial hub of Australia. Most of our GDP for the country comes from, um, you know, Sydney, and, you know, it is ever growing, but there is many other markets out there, you know, like Melbourne still, you know, got cheap properties. And if we look at Brisbane and the Gold Coast, I think that's the most underpaid city in the, in the country. And that's why I've been very bullish on it because, you know, we're seeing now at a point where someone could have bought a three bedroom red brick house going back in 2008 or 2007 in, I don't know, the Hills District of Sydney. And, you know, those properties were selling for like 500 at the time. They might be worth 1.2 at the moment. They could have a loan at 400,000. They could sell their property off, have 800 grand in the bank to go and buy a nice, five-year-old house, it's four bedroom, two bathroom, whatever, own it unencumbered and probably have a boat attached to the back of the yard, um, just for lifestyle. And if we look at, you know, the population, the growth, the infrastructure that's sort of planned for somewhere like that, um, you know, we're going to see, uh, you know, that that has the same fundamentals as Sydney had 20, 30 years ago. Um, when people go back, oh, the good old days, we had a quarter acre block and all that sort of stuff, that's still available but just not in Sydney because that's what it is. You know, you wouldn't expect to find a half a quarter acre block in, in New York when you're finding a, a unit for, you know, one, two million dollars for a studio unit. Um, just having a look here. Yeah, so understanding the fundamentals of how the, uh, the, the property market works, understanding how the fundamentals work of it, of the financial markets can, sort of give you in indication as to where we're heading. So uh, I'm going to go to the next slide just now uh, to show something. So uh, this here is total securitized debts um, from, uh, you know, all the way back in the 1970s. So something happened in 1971, uh, just for a quick recap on the origins of where money comes from. Uh, before 1971, we're working on a system called the Brenton Wood system. Uh, 1971, uh, President Nixon changed the uh, dollar to a complete fiat dollar. It was once beforehand backed by gold, but gold had backed money from 1933 all the way up to 1971. The US defaulted on their agreement, uh, and in turn, 
they had to change the monetary supply. So they turned the dollar into a, a um, petrodollar and it went from Austrian economics to Keynesian economics. And we've seen uh, the uh, reflections of Keynesian economics over the course of the last you know, 40, 50 years. Um, there's been, the dollar really started around 1971. So it's quite ironic, you can sort of see the debasement happening here on a chart. Um, and if you relay it back to a property front, it sort of lays a good picture as to where we are at. Um, pretty much, um, yeah, as I was saying beforehand, sorry. Um, the, the other thing that happened is that the US dollar uh, became the base currency of the world in 1971. So people often say, uh, if America catches a cold, if America gets sick, Australia catches a cold, so on and so forth. And that's the same with everyone because everyone's tied to the US dollar as the base currency of the world. So as we see here, a securitized debt, it's gone up to the 80s, it's gone up and is heading into a zone like people talk about inflation. I've talked about hyperinflation going back about uh, 12, 18 months ago. People were saying, I've lost the plot. Uh, you know, I'm talking shit, hyperinflation can't happen, they don't understand. Um, I encourage anyone that's watching or anyone that, you know, listens to anything I say to never trust what I say because it's the problem with society nowadays is that we question with it, we obey without questioning. I want people to be awake to this situation, be able to go out there and do their own research and go down the rabbit holes to see the fundamentals so you're more equipped and more educated to, to make your own decisions. But I personally think that what will happen is we're going to see uh, a, a crisis, a financial crisis throughout um, you know, the, the later part of this year. I'll get onto that later as to why I see that happening. And uh, from that, uh, I don't really see how we'll get past November 2018. The only way that we will would be through manipulation of monetary policy. Uh, could go on to 2019, but we're right on the precipice of it. And the only way out will be stimulating the economy uh, with lots of cheap money, stimulus packages, etc., which will push up prices. Um, seeing questions come through, I'll get to them a little bit later. I may answer them through um, through through my uh, through my presentation. So as we see here, we're seeing securitized debt all the way up. And this was the uh, GFC. The grey marks obviously mean a recessionary period. So we can see the late 80s, early 90s, early 2000s. And here we are uh, up in the GFC. Basically, things came down. Uh, we used quantitative easing, which was basically printing of money. And we pushed ourselves out of what could have been a big recession. But I think that what we've done at that period of time, looking at every bit of data that I can acknowledge, um, is that we have created the problem that we had, we've thrown it down the road and put a magnifying glass on it to the tune of 100 to 1,000 times worse than where it was and the fixing up will be much bigger next time. So here we are here just zooming in on that graph uh, from the early 2000s, it went all the way up and now we're at a higher point. Um, we're at a higher point than where we were in the GFC, the securitized debt. Uh, what I personally feel will cause the GFC part two, or the GFD as I call it, will be a financial instrument called a derivative. Uh, the derivatives market is really, really bad out there. Um, and, you know, I was actually talking to someone the other day that works from Wall Street, and they're in my office, and, you know, the sentiment was like, things are getting a bit interesting out there in the marketplace. So I'll, I'll leave it at that. I don't want to go too deep on that front. Um, what could happen with different types of properties over the years? I'm sort of navigating through different different sort of topics tonight. What um, what I've seen over the years, a lot of people get fixated just on you know should I buy a house? Should I buy a unit? But like people don't like units. People think that you need to have a house or you need to have um, a house with land or so on, so on and so forth. Um, for me, when I first started investing, I thought that it was important to have a house on a block of land. And, um, you know, I've always talked about the, the positive cash flow, neutral cash flow, having a strong cash flow and whatnot. I had, you know, a half dozen properties that were all houses. Um, so I used to refer to properties as houses, but then I realised I should turn, change the term to properties because it's a piece of property, whether it's a house, a unit, townhouse or so on. And as I was buying these houses, I was getting very, very negative, uh, very, I had a very negative cash flow position. And I realised that 
if I, the next deal that I had have done, if that had have been, you know, not right from a cash flow perspective, I wouldn't have been able to buy anything else. And I was fortunate enough to make the uh, acknowledgement and I went down the road of getting townhouses, units, villas, etc. And, you know, people often ask me, aren't you better buying a house or land than a unit? And you know, the reality of it is, is that, I'll just use an example. If I go back to the Mount Druitt days when I started building my portfolio, I could have bought a house for 200, 250,000 or I could have bought a, uh, a unit for 120 to 150,000. The house would rent for say 200 a week, the unit would rent for 170 per week. Um, sure you have, uh, you know, with the unit, you would have strata rates, uh, start strata fees and uh, that would be the extra cost and you don't have the land so much underneath. But when you have a house, you have building insurance, you have more land tax. So that's another expense that you need to factor into your cash flow. And so your land tax goes up um, and you know you have gutters to repair, drains to repair, a driveway to repair and so on and so forth. And what I realized is that I could hold say one and a half million dollars worth of units instead of say $600,000 worth of houses. And if I'm taking through one and a half million dollars through a property site and watching that double, that was far greater than having, you know, 600,000 doubling. So uh, I, would, I flipped my whole strategy in the early days to getting units, townhouses, villas, whatever I could get my hands on. If the numbers work for a house, that's great. And structuring a portfolio that had the right, um, you know, properties in it to get to the end goal of where I wanted to be. Uh, the other thing that I never, ever, ever factored in was rents increasing. And if we see, you know, uh, instability in the marketplace and there's not enough buyers out there buying and, you know, it's a bit turbulent from the buying front, we normally see uh, rents go up on the upright, upside. And we haven't seen rental increases, for example, in Sydney uh, to a high tune since about 2008. We saw the rents just, you know, almost double very, very quickly and has stayed pretty flat since. So it will be an exciting time, especially for someone like myself because I've got all these properties and the rents will rise and I hope that you guys can sort of benefit from that and just be mindful that to watch out for that sort of market cycle happen. Um, if you've got five units, we'll say six units instead of three houses and the rent goes up by 100 bucks on the house and 80 bucks by the unit, you're gonna end up with a much better cash flow position in that period of time as well. So. Um, you know, it's important to understand what is the actual property that you need at that time and how does that fit into the equation. Um, if the economy shifts itself, which I think it will, uh, commercial properties may be at a risk. Um, and the reason why I think the commercial properties are a little bit overvalued at the moment is uh, they used to be, you know, selling for a seven to ten percent rent return on them because they do have a higher risk to them. Um, I've been seeing a lot of properties for recent times sell at four or five percent rent returns, and it's way off off the chart. So for me, I think commercial properties may see a risk. I do own a fair few commercial properties, and I've got good tenants and you know, twenty year leases with national anchor tenants in front of them. So yeah, um, mining. Mining uh, markets, so if we look at um, you know, areas like Gladstone or the Hunter Valley or uh, Caratha or whatever, going back, um, and this is an important thing to remember, is that markets are counter-cyclical. So you've got fundamentals that are pushing those markets up. And why did the mining stock I don't buy mining properties. Um, out of my whole time of buying like 10,000 properties for myself and other people, um, probably would have bought five maybe uh, in a mining town um, just because they were cheap at the time. But I do feel that they do pose a high, high risk. Uh, if we look at some of those areas, properties went down by, you know, down to like 20%, they lost 80% of their value uh, because the mining companies removed themselves from the area or they closed down the mine and so on and so forth. But in a time of a financial uh, mess. Uh, if we look this week, we've seen a lot about oil prices and issues with the oil. The last time uh, we saw uh, oil prices having a big issue was back in pre-GFC, around the time of the GFC. And that's because uh, the financial instruments that are sort of uh, attached to those contracts, derivatives, um, you know, start meaning that they can't fill the contracts at the price. As the price rises, uh, it it's causing trouble. So as we can see, uh, the signs are out there. Um, 
commodities generally increase, whether it be gold, silver, um, wheat, uh, coffee beans, whatever. And Australia is a resource-rich country. So there is a potential, and I'm not suggesting by any way at all to go and buy mining properties. I'm not buying them. There might be a day where I'm going to go, these look really cheap because I can see before it happens, maybe, um, but I'm not touching uh, those sort of properties at this point in time. But just talk for the purpose of conversation today, that if commodity prices increase, uh, understanding the markets, this is an example, if you understand the markets as to commodity prices increasing, to pull that resource out of the ground becomes more profitable. They may start, uh, you know, a lot more mining, uh, you know, explorations may go on and those towns may fill back up. And at that point, there may be an opportunity in those sort of markets. Uh, for myself, I think that fundamental properties always win. Uh, I like to have bread and butter properties. I've always talked about, people say, buying a blue collar suburb is risky or you know buying the family area is risky or shouldn't you get a house in Vaucluse for those that aren't in Sydney like Vaucluse is Sydney's premium suburb where all the houses are in you know 50 mil plus but isn't that where you should be focusing to buy your properties and I think they're the highest risk properties out there the top end of town are the ones that get affected the most so you know, the opportunity may lay where you know you could remove some of your portfolio and go buy some better assets while those things are on sale. Um, the other thing to note um, throughout this cycle, and I've got a, a webinar on next week where I'm gonna be talking about the finance market, so make sure you keep an eye out for that one. But um, a lot of people ask me, like, should I sell my properties now? Like, I never give advice whether you should buy or sell. You know, you've got to make up those decisions to what you feel is best for you. But, you know, I think that if you need to sell, or if you think that you need to sell in the next couple of years, you've got to think to yourself, when would be the best time to actually, um, you know, get out of uh, get out of that property. Um, so if I look at the market moving forward, I think it's going to be more of a buyer's market rather than a seller's market. That's why I made the decision myself personally, and I put it out there on videos in the in the media last year, so on and so forth, and news.com and everything. That I was selling some properties because I wanted to get liquid so I could um, you know, sort of take my portfolio to the next level. A lot of people are asking, should I sell the properties that I've got or whatnot? What you've got to remember is that we're going through a, a credit tightening phase and getting access. If you've got 10, 15, 20 properties in your portfolio and you're gonna go sell them off, uh, what could happen is you probably most likely won't be able to service to replace them, to get those properties back again. So you need to make that call as to, do I need to sell the property? Do I want to sell the property? What is the benefit of selling the property? Where's the property going to be in five years, in 10 years, in three years? And the common factor that I always see is that I don't hear too many people saying, I'm glad I sold my property back in 2005. Normally they're upset that they sold their property back in 2005 or back in 2000 or 99 or 98. Um, and these cycles have gone throughout history and the reason why these properties go up in value isn't necessarily that the properties have gone up in value, it's probably more so to the fact that your dollar has bought less. Uh, if you think back pre-GFC in 2008, paddle pops were 80 cents, now they're like $2.50. If you had to bought $1,000 worth of paddle pops, it'd be pointless because their perishable would not die, like the fiddles go off. But if you had to bought $1,000 worth of paddle pops, the same, you know, 10, green uh, nodes, go and bought um, a thousand bucks worth of paddle pops, you would end up with 1200 paddle pops. You buy a thousand dollars worth of paddle pops now, you'll end up with 400, 500 of them. So your dollar is buying less. And that is obviously a complete reflection as to what's happened in the monetary system with property and whatnot. So uh, going through any marketplace, I like fundamental properties because you've always got an abundance of tenants. You've always got a, a market where people want to buy. I don't invest into student accommodation. I don't invest into holiday accommodation. I don't invest into retirement accommodation or any of those real quirky sort of markets. I don't invest in a boarding house if you can see them as a risk. But for me, if I was to invest into anything apart from boarding house, if I was to invest into um, you know, holidays and stuff like that, I have invested in them, but I've picked up the properties for like $15,000 or $20,000 because they're just so cheap. Um, they're the ones that are very, very high risk in any sort of market, but especially now. Um, I think it's also important to work out 
what phase of the journey uh, you're at. Um, uh, I'm seeing lots of questions come through here. I'll try and get to some of them a little bit later, guys, but keep them coming and I will do some videos on that later. Um, I think it's important to also work out as to what phase of your investing uh, career you're in. Are you in a phase where you're just starting out and you need to accumulate properties? Are you in a phase where you've just started accumulating properties and you need to buy more? Are you in a phase where you're sort of at the end of getting your foundations and you know going on to the next phase of consolidation and retirement from your, your property investment? So very important to uh, plan for that and make sure you don't get stuck. And that's, you know, there's a lot of people out there nowadays talking property, trying to be experts out there. And this is the sort of stuff that they just, you know, six months ago, two years ago, five years ago, they were landscapers or, you know, taxi drivers or whatever. And now they're just property experts and the market will shake them out. So be very careful where you get that information from, even from financial advisors. I do not like financial advisors. I've got less financial advisors and I speak to lots of them on a regular basis. So I would be able to count on my hand how many financial advisors I actually trust and respect out there. So be careful where you get information from. A lot of them are just insurance salespeople. Um, take a note, I'm just going to take a little break from the actual property stuff and talk a little bit about uh, yield curves. Uh, I always get stuck with thinking how much info I can put in to give you guys the content and uh, that's why I wanted to spread it out over five parts of the webinar series. But uh, this here was what I was, something I was looking up today just regarding yield curves and I realised that the yield curve in the UK is currently in an inverted yield curve. So an inverted yield curve always builds a recession. And this is just a little screenshot that I took earlier on uh, today, which uh, shows that uh, looking down the yield curve, it is starting to go into a abyss. Well, short-term and long-term interest rates are pretty similar to the Eurozone and US. In the UK curve is now clearly inverted, which often signals a recession. Compared this with base rates of 5.75 and 20 yields are now 75% 75 basis points lower. The only three months ago, the difference was about 50 points and a year ago, long-term views were above the base rates. Last time UK inversion was a pretty was big was in to early 2001 when there was widespread fears of a global slump. Currently, flat yields in the US and Eurozone do not point to an imminent world recession. The glitch glit market might be indicating the UK-specific downturn, but outside of a housing crash. It's hard to see what might cause this real interest rates, which with some view, blah, blah, blah. Um, please do know that as where the mouse is right now, this was in 2007. So just before the GFC, before moments before the GFC, they were saying, oh, it doesn't really mean it. It often signals a recession or whatever. Um, I'm going to take you to the 10-year uh, Treasury bonds here, which I look at on a daily basis. A lot of people say to me, Nathan, you look tired most of the time. That's because I don't sleep and I sleep for four hours. I normally stay awake for 20 hours in the day and I go throughout two different markets. I actually keep very strong correlation to what's happening in the US markets to understand what is happening out there. Um, now we're seeing a 10-year Treasury bond at 3% and I personally have been talking about, and once again, without giving financial advice, uh, as I'm not your financial advisor and I'm not a financial advisor at all, I'm just a dude that talks about random things with an opinion. Uh, I feel that once this hits about 325 to 3.5%, that we will see an impact zone happening. Um, if we have a look at what is happening with the yields, over here, um, the 10-year Treasury bonds, basically what this is indicating is a liquidity issue with money coming out of the marketplace. Uh, we are seeing them going up and they are starting to invert. This line here says it could get to 4%. Uh, I personally don't think it will hit that. Uh, if we have a look here, this was from uh, today or yesterday or something like that. Um, when the yield curve, the difference between the short term, this is from Business Insider UK, uh, Long-term government bond yields invert has historically signaled a coming recession. The gap between the two-year and the 10-year bonds hasn't been this thing since before the last recession. All the signs, you're not seeing it in the news because one, people don't like talking about fear in the media. I just talk about shit as it is. If the things are good, it's good. If the media want to hear what I have to say, they'll hear it. And if they don't want to hear about it, well, then they just won't put me on TV to talk about this stuff. So that's why I just say it as it is. I have no 
benefit from telling you guys that there's you know fear out there or things that could be a crash but if you're well prepared you can clean up and you know from my side i hope that you'll come back and say look nathan you told me how to protect myself through this how to take advantage of the opportunity through this and how to clean up through it and i've done really well and you know maybe i can help you out one day so um looking at the opportunities and the risk ends of the market i see that we are in a um I'm going to grab some water. I see we're at a phase where if we look throughout history, when a financial disaster comes, I wish I had put into this uh, slideshow presentation, right, but when a risky, when a, when a shaky time comes, um, the, the central banks, I, I don't even use the word government because it's not the government that controls it. They do have a level of control. But it's the central banks which put down the policies, which tries to avert uh, the countries going out of it, not, not going into recession. And the stimulus that comes from that uh, generally comes from a lot more debt. As I showed at the start of the presentation, the debt is increasing. And I personally feel that we're probably headed for a hyperinflation. Um, throughout history, as I said beforehand, this uh, dollar that we have changed significantly in 1971. That was the start of the dollar. It has been in decline since the early 1980s. Uh, with monetary policy every time go and have a look at interest rates on a chart interest rates have been heading uh, in one direction that's down every time there's a recession they start heading back up but they go down uh, due to the fact um, that the, the, it, it's it's the ponzi scheme basically i'll call it that there we go um, that how the financial markets are and as i said this is just very opinionated uh, this is just me being raw and uncut like the series is meant to be told and um you know interest rates have been heading backwards dalton out of all fair currencies the ten thousand of them that have been in the last one thousand years uh they've all been hyperinflated they've all uh, never none of them have really lasted more than 45 years uh this time here every time there's been a hyperinflation look at venezuela look at zimbabwe look at germany in the 20s um, so on and so forth. There's literally been heaps of them, hundreds, thousands of them, tens of thousands of them, I should say. Um, over the years, they've all ended in a hyperinflation. Hyperinflation. Go and understand what a hyperinflation is. That can give some indication as to where we are heading. Um, you might be wondering why I, why I made a call going back in uh, late 2017, how I could see the interest rates may go up. And this is a may, it just depends on how everything is panning out the back end and what triggers they're pulling and what leaders they're pulling. But uh, yield curves, uh, you know, if the interest rates don't head up in price, in, 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 its, uh, in its basis points, the 30 day, the 90 day LIBOR rate, the three month LIBOR rate could hit it. Uh, and that would cause liquidity to be sucked out of the system. So either way, the rates have to increase to keep away from that. If they increase too high, we're gonna see recessionary or deflationary cycle if it hits it we're going to see a liquidity come out of the system so you know it's sort of which way do you want to take it um and one of the ways is going to happen but what happens after any of these cycles or what happens through these cycles is lots of stimulus and you know what i'm seeing is stimulus for the next cycle uh, i'll get onto that a little bit later but uh, from the opportunities that will happen actually i'll go into the stimulus the stimulus could be in the way of universal basic income, which we've heard the Greens leaders talk about recently, which you probably never heard of universal basic income, which is basically settling for everyone. Um, they've trialed it out in Switzerland, I think, or the Netherlands, one of those places, uh, which has got negative interest rates. Interest rates, if they head to a negative territory, and there's countries around the world, developed countries that have got negative interest rates. And if the economy was so great, why have interest rates been you know, kept for 20 odd months at one and a half percent interest rates or 150 basis points. Why have they not been able to go up? Why are they stuck at this low level? And it's because if they increase them too high, it's not just going to affect the property market, it's going to affect the whole economy because uh, in essence, businesses that have got debt, all the businesses around the world have got debt, um, or most of the businesses around the world have got debt, and those businesses that have got the debt would implode. A lot of businesses are throwing money into an incinerator just to stay open. If you go and look at the news, you'll see even your favourite car company, Tesla, that's doing great things to the world, is costing, I think it's 10, 
ten million dollars a day or ten billion dollars a day that it costs to keep open, or ten million dollars a day to keep open. So when stimulus comes, I personally feel that we'll see the dollar die and crash. Uh, and that's just a personal opinion, as I said, not financial advice. And I think that what will happen is we'll see a hyperinflation. A hyperinflation, debt becomes irrelevant with inflation. That's why I like the fundamentals of property because uh, it, you can use debt attached to it. You can take that asset, it will be inflated due to the monetary system dying. That's why it continuously goes up and there's a debasement there and people feel poorer and poorer, uh, but you feel richer and richer another way. Um, as well as, um, yeah, there's lots of lots of factors that are causing. I was just had a little mind blank because I was thinking of something else. But I think universal basic income, interest rates reducing, um, we'll see uh, stimulus packages, whether it be nine hundred dollars or whether we look at the budget that occurred two days ago. Um, I didn't notice the first minute, but it actually is basically like a thousand, uh, five hundred dollars. A year that you're getting back from the from the tax, uh, you know these stimulus packages are going to keep, uh, you know, supporting and propping up markets out there. Um, it could come in the form of first home grants being increased, uh, stamp duty being reduced, um, so on and so forth. So keep an eye out for those triggers, which you know are sort of showing a sign of life back for liquidity into the property market. Um, but I think that throughout the opportunities that we'll see throughout the, the, this coming time. Uh, will be bargains. I'm already seeing bargains. Uh, there's real estate agents out there that I don't do business with anymore because before the property boom, they were my best mates and throughout the property boom, they got greedy and I told them to fuck off in nice words, actually in those words, and to delete my number, don't call me, don't call my staff, don't call anyone from my office ever again because I won't do business when you need me. And uh, basically, you know, everyone starts calling now because uh, things are getting tougher out there in the marketplace and they, want, they know that, you know, Nathan can do deals or so on and so forth. So um, the bargains are coming, the bargains are there. Uh, I'm picking up good opportunities moving forward uh, as to how cheap they get, how long this goes on. Uh, it just depends as to when stimulus comes in and when liquidity starts flowing into the marketplace. Um, with it, um, just looking at comments coming through, thanks for the positive feedback, guys. Um, looking at the potential for hyperinflation, as I said, debt becomes irrelevant with inflation. Uh, if we see inflation, the debt becomes cheaper uh, and it's easy to pay off. So what I mean by that is <clears throat> not necessarily that the house, that a property has gone value. If I bought a property for 200 grand in 2005 or 2008 and now it's worth four, 500,000, uh, I could go back with today's dollars and pay it off because 200,000 wouldn't mean as much today as what it meant back in uh, 2008. Um, I think we'll see a hike in interest rates in the short period of time. It may go up uh, a quarter of a percent, a half a percent. If we're really, really uh, pushing it down the road, it could go up to 1% higher. I don't see it going much higher. Uh, if interest rates went up by 100%, 100 basis points, uh, what that would mean is, in essence, uh, there'd be a lot of blood on the street. Uh, and it seems really stupid because interest rates should be much higher than what they are, but it just comes from, you know, it's uh, you're just manipulating what shouldn't be manipulated. Um, I think it's impo important to keep on top, um, on, top on top of your uh, portfolio with rents, cash flows, cash flow and liquidity be the two biggest things that I think that one should look at. Uh, cash flow is to make sure that you don't lose your shit being warned now to go and you know look at what would happen in a worst case scenario. It doesn't mean the world's on fire, but what would happen if this happened or that happened or if interest rates went up or, or so on and so forth. Um, the rent side of things, keep on top of your rents. I think it's very, very important to be proactive with your rents because $10 per week, if you've got 10 properties, that's 100 bucks a week. Um, you know, you don't need a budget to worry about, when I say the budget, the budget from the government, you don't need to worry about your $10 when you get you a, a hamburger nowadays. Uh, you know, that's inflation, that's inflation. We've seen inflation, it's a silent inflation. They say the CPI index is less than 3%, but what I do understand and believe is that it doesn't include utilities and it doesn't include uh, foods. So, um, you know, we're, we're seeing inflation that's happening out there at the moment. Um, 
But if you can increase your rents by $10 per week and have 10 properties that go up by $10 per week, that's $100 per week, that's $5,200 per year. If you can do that every year for the next you know, five years, then you're gonna be up 25 grand a year on your bottom line. Um, look at the uh, the market conditions. I do see some questions uh, coming through. I, I will answer this one here. Um, APRA loosing, will APRA loosen regulation uh, moving forward? I believe that APRA has come in and done uh, a policy um, tightening uh, in order to do what an interest rate would normally do. So if the interest rates, as I said, and you think about it, the last time we saw, when we started seeing APRA come out and everything was back in uh, September 2016, around that period of time. And it's all out there, it's all in graphs, graph statistical data, you just need to understand what to look for, so on and so forth. I think as a stimulus, when the market does get shit, that they will be forced to make monetary policy uh, easy to get uh, in order to stimulate the economy. They're going to be looking for anything that they can to stimulate the economy. So. Um, that's where the opportunity is because if everyone, if Apple reduces the regulations, I know sure as sure as shit that uh, I've got lots of equity that I can go buy more properties with. All my clients have got more equity than go more, buy more properties with. Mum and dad down the street that can go and pull out equity from the house and go and buy furniture, an extension, a pool, a car, use the house as an ATM, whatever it takes. You know, they're the sort of things that I think to watch out for, and that's when we know that we're going to be back into. A, a bull cycle uh, in the property market. So I think it's important to capitalise on that. Uh, diversify your, um, you know, your, your position. Uh, for me, myself, um, you know, I've used many different financial instruments over the, the years. I used to uh, day trade the share market. Uh, I don't do that. I think it's too risky. I don't buy shares anymore. Does it mean I wouldn't? Uh, if I said I wouldn't, that would be an arrogant move from my front, but I just think it's too risky for me personally and I don't do that. Once again, this is financial advice. I'm just talking what I do and what I'm doing. Um, you know, I invest in businesses. I invest in people. I invest in um, precious metals. I invest in the commodities. I invest in the other financial instruments. I do invest in the crypto. I'm very knowledgeable in that space. Um, and they're all just financial instruments. So for me, I look at that because that's a liquidity. Like it's it's something easy. If you if you can't sell your house, then uh, you could have something to push a button and sell it. So, um, not advising anyone to make any decisions. Uh, this is a property conversation and a financial market condition as what I'm seeing as an opinionated piece. So just you know, obviously, I don't want to break any laws in the uh, the matrix that we live in. So I'm not your financial advisor. Take all of this as entertainment instead of could be watching this or you could be watching Married at First Sight. Uh, unfortunately, most people go to Married at First Sight to uh, get their relationship advice. Uh, they go to the same places that show you Sesame Street and that to go and get financial advice off there. Uh, just be very careful where you do get your advice from. Uh, I'd like to think that I have a brain. Uh, I'd like to think that, you know, I'm opening you up to go and do some research. Uh, I do think that it could be entertainment, educational, whatever you take it as, but it's not financial advice. Um, the uh, I'm just having a look here. I've got some notes here, but I don't want to take too long. Um, yeah, over the course of the last 12 months, uh, I'm not going to talk about it at this point in time. Every time I have a strategy, uh, I always try it out on myself, make sure if I blow my arms off, I'm not blowing other people's arms off. Um, so I have been working on some very, very interesting strategies to get through uh, this next phase, and I will probably be talking about them sometime over the course of the next six to 12 months, so stay tuned to my channels um, as to what I'll be talking about uh, from those new strategies. Um, yeah, very, very interesting strategies to uh, be able to keep purchasing properties without the need of banks and, and so on and so forth. Um, yeah, and I, I'd, I'd consider that those strategies that I have used over the years, um, you know, has set me apart from anyone else that's really out there in the marketplace to be able to build my portfolio, build my success from all different aspects um, in, in a financial sense. I'm not saying that I'm great in everything in life. Uh, however, you know, I, I do, um, you know, take a bit of pride when I, I do do cool things and people go, hey, how do you do that? And it's, you know, it's pretty cool. So uh, strategies is ultimately important. Um, and I'm working on some new strategies for low income earners 
um, low savings, high debt people, all those sorts of things. Um, and then trying to you know see myself as to how I can navigate myself through uh, this time, obviously bringing you know almost two decades worth of experience to the table in this space. Just on um, some more interesting, fun, uh, fun things to talk about. Um, I don't just talk about property. I talk about other hobbies of mine in other places on social media or whatever. But um, on this occasion, uh, I thought I'd show this. I, I do talk about this sort of stuff quite regularly on just the little channel that I got on on Facebook. Um, but uh, basically, here this is the unwind of the quantity of easing. So since two thousand and eight, um, the uh, the US Fed has uh, introduced a lot of quantitative easing out there in the marketplace. Quantitative easing uh, has been in the way of stimulus for money. And there's a few things to note. Uh, and sorry for jumping all over the place. I we'll just get too excited uh, with lots of things to discuss. But if we look back at the start of this year, Trump, and go back to the US with Trump, uh, he had an issue with uh, having money, and the, the news said that oh, Parliament got stuck or whatever, Congress got stuck, and he got a lifeline thrown to him for like a few months. He didn't want to have to go across the other floor and negotiate deals he didn't want to do, so he tried to get a bit more creative with it. Um, the Fed is unwinding uh, the, the, the debt that's made, uh, and if we have a look at it there, there's um, the end of the taper happened, uh, it went to a flat period, and looking at about November last year in 2017 was the start of quantitative tightening. Quantitative tightening, um, basically we've created over the course of the last decade tens of uh, trillions of dollars worth of just debt, debt to stimulate the uh, economy. Uh, before that, uh, going back in the 70s, it wasn't even a trillion dollars of debt. Uh, going back in the 80s, I think we hit the trillion dollars worth of debt. And now we're in the tens of trillions of dollars and we're in a period where the Fed in the US is trying to unwind uh, the debt. So uh, it started off at $10 billion per month late last year, as we can see here, uh, $10 billion, $10 billion, $10 billion. And it started going up by $10 billion every month. So it went to $20 billion, $20 billion, $20 billion. Now it's going to $30 billion, $30 billion, which is where we saw the last um, crack in the system. And I keep over, like overviewing this. I don't invest in the stock market. I said that beforehand. And I'm overlaying this with the Dow and with other financial markets. And you can see where things are getting hit uh, as they're actually unwinding the quantity of easing that's gone on. And um, yeah, looking at that front, um, this is just something I've Googled that came up in, a, in, in my news today and I sort of snapshot it. Uh, Jamie Dimon, uh, the key that makes markets, the, the, the key is that the markets are in uncharted territory when it comes to what central banks are setting out to do. We've never had quantitative easing, we've never had reversal. So this guy here, I have no time for the guy at all. Uh, he's from JP Morgan, uh, he's their number one guy, he's always in the news globally, uh, talking about certain things. And um, if that's from him saying that he doesn't know what could happen with quantitative easing, uh, we're actually in uncharted borders and I don't think everyday uh, population um, you know, is really aware of this stuff because, you know, as I said, most people are watching the Kardashians or whatever to get their advice from. So uh, just on my research, I'm going to try and wind this up because I can see we're taking a little bit longer, but I just want to close off on a few things. My, uh, I'm feeling that things are tough out there. They're going to get tougher. Opportunities are out there. It's not something to be scared about. It's something to embrace because the biggest wealth transfers happen in these sort of times and it depends whether you're uh, in that position and are prepared for it or you're going to be in the painful side to, to hand over wealth. So it's important to get knowledgeable, uh, do your research. I, I encourage you to post over questions or whatever. Um, I think it's important to be uh, positioned to buy when things are low. I think it's important to uh, get on top of your finances, uh, speak to your finance strategist, whether it be your broker or whatever, uh, make sure that they're sort of in the right headspace and they understand what's happening in the market. If they don't understand what's happening in the market, you've probably got the wrong person. Um, bear in mind money is cheap at the moment 
and has been for a long time. If it gets cheaper, uh, I look at debt personally at the moment as an asset because I can use debt to you know acquire different assets, and, and it might sound very weird thinking, but you know, and I, I, I'll throw the disclaimer: I'm not your financial advisor. Get in there, but I do think that if uh, debt is used for the right purposes, it can be good because you know it's it's attached to uh, assets which will increase in value if you use it for the right purposes. It you know can make you wealthy. Uh, and I say that with knowledge. Uh, I've probably got more debt than anyone in this webinar and most uh, Australians out there. Uh, I do have a lot of debt. I need to understand how debt works. I need to understand how financial markets work in order for me to be able to know what my next move is. So I'm just sharing this stuff. Normally in my YouTube videos, I just go, oh yeah, she'll be right, blah, blah, blah. But you know, honing on the, the real important stuff that you don't see out there, that's why I made uh, these, these webinars. So um, make sure that your cash flow is strong. Uh, look for other aspects of uh, being able to invest. And some people, um, you know, buy properties. They may think that they can't buy a property, um, but if you have a financial advisor that can help you out, you could potentially buy a property in a super fund or your self-managed super fund or whatever, but it's important that you go get the advice on that. Um, I think that a lot of stuff out there in the media is bullshit. Uh, I call it as bullshit. Uh, it just, you know, you've got uh, people that are giving advice that don't know shit. You've got people that are giving advice for their own personal gains and benefits out there. Uh, you've got people that just really don't know. Um, you know, they're self-proclaimed, you know, experts in whatever field they're in. But, you know, when the tide comes out, you see who's, you know, got a small one and who's got a big one when they're swimming naked. So, um, and I think that the financial market is very shaky at the moment. And on that note, I'll take you to this graph here. As we can see, um, where it's in the green highlight behind the red uh, is where the um, you know some of the largest uh, financial trouble times are. And if we look at the spike that we're seeing at the moment, uh, we've gone into GFC. Uh, now we're coming out. Everything's been on exponential growth, but this time I believe it's runaway uh, problems that we're seeing. How money works? Uh, this thing here is. Um, from, I forget where I put my stats from this one here, but it's from like the RBA, I, I believe. Um, the velocity of money, understand how the velocity of money works. The velocity of money is the amount of times that money is being turned over. So uh, am I taking money and sitting on it and parking it or am I spending it? And a lot of people think that money is going around faster than it used to or whatever. But if we notice here at certain points, right, like as, the dollar is dying, the velocity of money is dying as well. And if that gets really low, that's going to be a big trouble. Um, and we're going to need to print a hell of a lot more money. The more that the velocity slows down, the more money that we need to print in order to get the velocity happening again. And it's on a down death spiral, in my opinion. So I um, just want to review uh, you know, all my moves in previous markets. I've uh, made it. A few little notes here, um, but I think it's a read off the top of my head. I'll just uh, make sure I can. Yeah, so um, I started buying property going back in 2003. Uh, I was 18 years old. I could sign a contract. Uh, I got excited by property in 1998. I was 13 years old while most of my mates were, you know, finding magazines with girls in them. Uh, I was finding them too, but. Uh, I was finding magazines with houses in them and trying to get excited by the prospect of being wealthy one day. And I thought that, you know, rich people have properties. I want to own properties. How can I get into them? And that's sort of how my journey started on that front. I saved up enough money. I saw the boom of 98, 99, 2000, 2001, all the way up. I couldn't buy a property because I couldn't sign a contract. My parents have had me 10 years before or five years beforehand. I probably could have been more equipped to take advantage of that market cycle. Uh, but I did watch it and I was very much in the trenches uh, with envy going, wow, I wish I could buy this property, so on and so forth. And I realized that every time I save up like 10 grand, um, I was working as a kid, like I worked until like 13 years old, just hustling uh, in a family business. And um, yeah, I, 
thought, you know, if I can save 10 grand, the house price went up 30, 40 grand. And they're the things that you hear on TV, people going, oh, you know, keep saving up and I can't get the property. You know, I saw that cycle at the start. The first one in uh, Mount Druitt, when people were saying that, you know, the properties um, are shit out there, whatever the case may be, I saw the value. Uh, couldn't buy any more out there, so I started looking for other areas. Went to uh, the area Central Coast, uh, southwestern Sydney. Went to regional areas because I needed cash flow that I wanted to buy some bigger properties. So I started buying motels, shopping centres, commercial properties. Went in the state, started buying other properties, re-getting like my foundation portfolio of what I did in Sydney, in Queensland. And then I came back and then I started buying some development sites and I started building properties and so on and so forth. So I've had to sort of navigate myself through every sort of market in order to get you know, the right properties, the right strategy, the right structuring at each step of the time. And I feel a lot of people, when they go to invest, they point the finger, blame something, the economy, the market, whatever. Um, but if you can understand how that is working in the back end, you can understand how you can you know, capitalize on that and, and be successful. So uh, on that note, um, I appreciate everyone coming on tonight, but I do have something uh, to talk about to help people get through the masses. I've all seen the matrix. I've talked about the matrix for many, many years. Uh, you're, you know, I feel that we're all slaves. We're born into this system. And uh, for me, I've used property as a vehicle to uh, be able to exit myself from that matrix at a young age to be able to live life on my terms. And uh, on that note, I've had a lot of people ask me for mentoring, uh, mentoring over the course of the last few years. Um, I don't. I did mentoring once uh, for clients. Uh, that was back when I first started the business. I took on board uh, 20 clients and I said, I'll help you out for a period of a year. Did mentoring with them, it was one-on-one. -on -one. And um, in essence, uh, I made, I think, a dozen property millionaires uh, out of that and uh, you know shared my knowledge with them and helped them uh, advance and sort with their own personal investing uh, in their portfolio. So uh, I said I'd never do it again. Uh, I'm not gonna do it in that fashion. Uh, I've committed myself for the next 12 months by helping the masses in a very low cost fashion uh, in order to be able to deliver uh, the content to help get everyone through uh, what I see as a financial mess happening out there, as well as being able to uh, download all of my knowledge over the course of the last uh, 15 years. So anything from negotiation, how to find properties, where to find properties, how to uh, you know, renovate properties, how to do renos for on the cheap for under 10 grand, kitchen, bathroom, paint, carpet, all that sort of stuff. How to you know look at finance hurdles, how to look at structuring, how to look at the mindset, um, and all those sorts of things. I'll also be bringing in my teams. Uh, I have got a financial advisory firm, I've got a, a finance company, I've got real estate offices nationally, I've got a law firm, I've got a building company. So I'll be sharing you know, my, my people from my teams, of my businesses that I've built, uh, for them to be able to specifically hone in on some of those topics as well. Uh, so with the mentoring, there will be a 12 month mentoring program. Mentoring program uh, will be $3,000 per year. Uh, for those that get into the, on the early bird, uh, will be going to $8,000 very, very shortly. And then after I've got all the positions filled, I'll be canceling it and probably never doing it again. So um, there is you know, an incentive there to get on early, to be a part of the early bird. Um, I will be covering everything over the course of the last 15 years that I've, earned, I've learned. Um, as for uh, the, the pricing of it, uh, $3,000 per year is $60 per week. I spend more on my um, personal trainer than that. And um, yeah, the other thing is as well is that I'll be doing two live event, uh, three live events of two days throughout the course of the next 12 months. Uh, I've been asked over the years to do an hour of my time in front of someone to talk to someone for an hour and they'll pay me $5,000, which I reject because I don't uh, sell my time for money. Um, I don't need to, I just do it because I want to do it if I feel the need to. And I do feel that there is a need for this education to help people get ahead, uh, you know, not just through a normal time, but through, especially through, um, you know, what I see coming up in the, in the course of the next 12 to 24 months. So, um, you know, There'll be fortnightly webinars that will be uh, all the information of things that I've learned. That will be three uh, two day live events. So you'll be spending six days with me uh, over the period of the next 12 months. Um, and you know, for $3,000, that's less than 
a hundred bucks an hour, hundred dollars an hour for my time. So on that note, you'll probably get an email from my office in the not too distant future, which would be like an auto responder with some details about the mentoring program. Uh, but on that note, I appreciate uh, everyone's time this evening. I know I've gone over to an hour and a half. So thanks a lot for having me as a part of your Thursday night viewing. Uh, we'll catch up soon and have a great night.